Thanks uh, very much, Jermaine, for inviting me months and months ago when he, when he invited me. Uh, um, I'm, I'm actually a recent addition to the program, which is great because I'm uh, my topic, I think, is a, a good follow-up to what Dr. Oda was talking about. And that's, uh, well, I'll just start out actually with something entertaining that happened to me a few years ago when I was in Egypt, where I won't be going anytime soon. And I was walking along the sidewalk, and I found, uh, you know, these sidewalk book markets. And there was a great book there that said, the title was, Zawaj al Mutahalal. Of course, I immediately bought the book, and I had my <laughs> collection of, of books on this topic in my office. And then I, I, I uh, found another book, some, and nearby it says, you know, Zawaj al Mutaharam, for this, for the Quran and Sunnah. So uh, there was a rebuttal to that book. The main argument in the <coughs> Mutah marriage is halal. Book was that the companion Ibn Abbas had, depending on who you believe, either for a time or for his entire life, he believed that Mutah marriage was halal. So you actually had this very esteemed companion of the Prophet who held that Mutah marriage was uh, acceptable in Islam. Obviously, this is not popular amongst the other Sunni schools of law, amongst all the Sunni schools of law. So that's one example. I want to uh, mention another example as well, also involving. Uh, Ibn Abbas. And this is the question of the threefold divorce. So if a man says to his wife, Inti talik, inti talik, inti talik, you're divorced, you're divorced, you're divorced, all the four Sunni schools of law say that that woman is immediately and irrevocably divorced. Uh, Ibn Taymiyyah famously disagreed with this, and uh, his argument for why this should only count for one of the three divorces and should not be irrevocable was that, first of all, he believed that this was the spirit of the Quran, he believed that this was the way that the, actually the Prophet had. Um, um, prescribed the practice of divorce, which is true according to Hadiths. And finally, he said this is the ruling of Ibn Abbas. So, here you have two different opinions, one of which people in Egypt would find despicable, or uh, namely the Muslim marriage ruling. The other one that is actually became the basis for a lot of modern divorce law in Muslim countries. So the Ottoman Family Law of 1917 and many other law codes after that, partially based on that, actually take the 10 years ruling for the triple divorce, making a three, three declarations of, di of divorce in one session only equal to one declaration of divorce. I think, uh, and I'm sure lots of people agree, that that's actually a very good uh, rule to take, and it actually does pr uh, promote the welfare of Muslims. So what you have here is a great example of attention, which is that the diversity of the Islamic legal heritage, especially in its early period, is both a tremendous resource, it's a blessing, in that it gives Muslims a giant toolkit, or the analogy I like to use for my students, a Mr. Potato Head bucket of parts, a giant bucket of parts you can draw from, to solve the, the problems of Muslim, and to promote Muslims' best interests, legitimately. Of course, as we saw with the case of Ibn Abbas and Mutah marriage, it's also a risk. The early, the, the diversity of the Islamic legal tradition is a liability, it's a risk, it's a temptation. Because just as one can promote the, the advancement or protection of Muslim interests using it, one can also allow or excuse illegitimate desires, your ahwa, your desires, your different agendas, uh, exploitation using this. And that, that's what's usually referred to as the tabo al ruchas or following the different licenses or dispensations. And a good example of this comes from the uh, scholar originally from Basra, he moved to Sana'a, Ma'am Ma Ma bin Rashid died in 153 Hijri, who said that if you take the opinion of the people of Mecca in Muta marriage and Sarf, which is kind of exchanging monies, and you take the opinion of the people in Medina on anal sex and listening to music, you take the people, opinion of the people of Kufa on um, intoxication, you'll be shot of Allah. You'll be the worst person of all human beings, the worst of God's creation. So uh, th this was the big fear, is that people, are, Muslims are going to cobble together a Sharia out of all the different odd licenses or anomalous weird opinions that they find in the legal heritage end up with a really, really terrible version of Islam, which no one would accept, but which is actually technically legitimate in the sense that it comes out of this historical heritage. How, uh, the, the way that Muslim scholars dealt with this, this tension, how to avoid the, take advantage of its good sides without falling into its 
and to his, and to, to any of his liabilities is uh, through several methods. One is to talk about intentions. Second is to try and actually set up some procedural restrictions. The third one is to set a set of um, qualifications. And the fourth one, and this is not really something they thought of, I think, but it's something that we have to look at as inevitable, ineluctable, is that this is also always going to be subject to political considerations. It's always going to be subject to political considerations, by which I mean uh, people's interests, the interests of the powerful, the interests of regnant cultural ideas, the interests of what people are drawn to in their daily lives. So you can never, this, these also, this also has a huge influence over what's a legitimate choice and what's an illegitimate choice in terms of drawing on this legal heritage. Muslim scholars had to look at this from two perspectives. The first was in their capacity as judges. For my students who've had to sit through me talking about this before, I apologize. That's primarily Merve and Tuba over there. We have to remember that Muslim scholars aren't just intellectuals. They're not just people who talk about what's ethical and what feels what's good for you. They also serve as judges. And so they had to, they really had to make sure that they were establishing a legal order that was workable, at least on a local level, and it was consistent and um, uh, unified at a, at, a, at a theoretical global level. By the, by the 1200s, what had basically emerged, whether you're talking about North Africa, which is obviously Al-Maliki, or Central Asia, or Iran, or the Arabian Peninsula, is that if you had an area with one dominant school of law like Maliki, North Africa, judges would either by decree of the ruler or pretty much most of the time by their own kind of peer pressure, they would be expected to rule by the what's called the mashur of the medhab, the main, the main opinion or the primary opinion of the school of law. If you were a senior judge, you would have more, la uh, more latitude in taking from other rulings in, the, in that one medhab. If you were in an area where uh, there were, uh, sorry, I should specify something else. There was also times, especially in the Hanafi school of law, we see this a lot in the Ottoman Empire, in the, um, the Indian Mughal Empire, which uh, Moise Khalfoui writes about, that the, the sultans or the rulers would also specify a specific ruling that was not the main ruling of the method that should be taken. Uh, so we have lots of examples of this in the Ottoman Empire, like, uh, that uh, instead of the main Hanafi ruling, which prohibits making endowments with cash or you know gold and silver, you have that normally you wouldn't be allowed to do that in the Hanafi school. You could only in, in any school actually you'd have to make an endowment with you know land or a shop or something like that. Uh, where the the Ottoman Sultan said that no, we're going to take the ruling of Zufar, one of Abu Hanifa's early disciples, which says that you in fact can use um, make cash waqfs. And this was very important because guess what? By that point in the 1500s, the Ottoman economy, especially its religious economy, medrasas, hospitals, mosques, they were all running off cash walks. That's a very good example of how political reality determines what's an acceptable choice. And a lot of scholars, especially non-government associated scholars in the Ottoman Empire in the 1500s, when this debate happened, people like Pir Ali Birgiwi, who wrote the uh, Tariq al Muhammadiyya. He really had a lot of severe, ar severe arguments with the establishment of ulama in the Ottoman Empire, saying you guys are really uh, betraying the legacy of Hanafi school of law and doing what's inappropriate by allowing this. But the political power of the sultan um, carried the day. So that, that's in an area where you have one dominant school of law. If you had it in a place like Egypt where you have multiple schools of law coexisting, the Maliki school and the Hanafi school and the Shafi'i school, uh, what you ended up with by the 1200s and 1300s is kind of a systematic telfiq, or a systematic picking and choosing. So uh, it wasn't that people just went to the Hanafi court when they wanted something in the Shafi court, and it was just total chaos. It was understood exactly what court you were supposed to go to for certain issues. So if you wanted to tear down a mosque that was endowed by a walk, you can't really tear down mosques because they're eternal. Um, you would go to the Hanbali court because the Hanbalis actually allow the government to basically exercise eminent domain and tear down a mosque or a waqf if it's been determined to be uh, you know, decrepit, which is a very subjective decision. So if you, if you, it was understood precisely which courts you would go to for which issues. It wasn't just legal chaos. Um, but the other 
dimension, a very important dimension of scholars' um, duties, was not as judges, but as muftis and as advisors and as articulators of Islamic ethics. And by, by Islamic ethics here, I mean things that aren't going to see the inside of a courtroom. Everything I just talked about was only if you were actually in a, in a, went to a court. For all sorts of things like fasting and prayer and uh, your hajj and all these other things, you would never actually um, be in a court. So when it came to scholars acting as muftis, they, they also had different approaches to solving this, this problem or dealing with this tension between uh, Islamic legal diversity as a resource, legitimate resource, versus as a, a temptation into sin. By the, the 1200s, what you saw is basically three, and I think really this emerged in the 1200s, three different approaches to this. The first one you can think of as a very permissive approach, which basically said, uh, you can do fatwa shopping. You as you know, Ahmed Muslim can go and just ask any member of muftis you want what their ruling is, and you just take the one you like. And it doesn't matter if you take the easiest one because you're lazy and you want to be able to drink or something like that. Um, this is fine. Why? Because deeds are determined by intentions. If you have bad intentions, God's not going to reward you or God's going to punish you, even if it's allowed in this life. Uh, second, and this was a, the biggest argument, that the companions did this. That doesn't mean the companions went around doing awful fetal shop. What it means is that they didn't have established medhebs. They would ask each other about different rulings, and then they would take what they thought was right. So you can't require somebody to follow a certain method because this was not what the companions had done. And you can see in this a very, I'll use the word Salafi because it's useful, it's not, they, people didn't actually call themselves Salafis, but this idea of using the companions and their conduct really as the uh, defining model for what you can demand of Muslims and expect. So the fact that the, the, the companions didn't restrict themselves to any one school of law means that we cannot restrict people today. People have to be free to choose. So that's maybe a very permissive approach. This was, uh, you find this in people like Isadine ibn Abdusalam died in 1262. Or, <coughs> yeah, 1262. And um, uh, Zarkashi, Muhammad bin Bahadur Zarkashi, who died in uh, 1394. The second uh, approach is sort of a, really emerged amongst, amongst the Shafi scholars of the Middle East. It was first articulated by people like uh, Ibn Taqiq al died in 1302 and uh, Tajidi Nasuki. And this was that they set up a, a, a body of procedures. For example, you uh, could not pick and choose between medhabs such that the resulting action was unacceptable to the school you were coming from and the school you are going to. What does that mean? Let's say I want to pray. So I, uh, I, I do my ablutions. <laughs> And I only wipe part of my head, which is okay in the Shafi school, and the Hanafi school, and the Hanbali school, not okay in the Maliki school. And then I go and I pet a dog. Hey, dog. And I go and pray. And I say, oh, but the Malikis, they say dogs are not filthy, so it's okay. Well, the, the Shafis say that the dog is filthy. The, the Malikis don't accept me wiping half of my head. So I actually have actually put together a Mr. Potato Head that's internally inconsistent. And later on, this list of restrictions gets simpler, and what it says is you can't have a resulting ruling or set of connected rulings that is objectionable or unacceptable to all Muslims. So if you come up with something where you say, I'm going to take the Maliki ruling, which a minority Maliki ruling says I don't have to give my wife a mahar, and I'm going to take the Hanafi ruling, which says I don't need my uh, to ask her the permission of the wali, and I'm going to take this other ruling so they don't need to have witnesses, I basically end up with a marriage with no ma no mahar, no witnesses, and no permission of the wali, which no one is going to accept, except the, the young people probably. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Third, uh, th some other restrictions that they put in there was that, in sh it, ideally, the person doing this, whether it's the the lay person who's going and seeking out opinions of muftis, or the, whether it's the muftis themselves giving the ruler ruling. They should do it because they believe this is the strongest opinion. This enjoys the best evidence. Uh, or that there is some need involved. So even if it's not the best, strongest opinion you're, uh, by your judgment as a scholar or by your decision as a layperson, there's some need 
legitimate need. So it's interesting, here we have to distinguish between need and necessity. And uh, I haven't seen a lot of people who talk about this, although I'm sure I'm missing it. Jalal Dina Suyuti talks about it in Ashbah and Abayah, that necessity, darura means, if you don't do this, you're going to die. Or really close to it, right? So if you, don't, if, you, if you are dying of starvation, you can eat a giant pig carcass. Or at the, as I always like to make the joke, you know, Joe's ribs and bibs shack in the desert. If you're dying of starvation, you can go and eat the, the pulled pork sandwich. Uh, if you're not dying of starvation, but you're really hungry, and it's causing tremendous difficulty and problems for you, that's haja, that's need. So that would mean, for example, you could get permission to break your Ramadan fast. If you're ill, if you're having, if you're, something's wrong with your body, you're just, every day you're miserable because of Ramadan fasting, you might not have to fast Ramadan, according to the Mufti. Or uh, here you might have things like, um, uh, it, it would never allow what is prohibited. No school of law says that it's okay to eat pork. So only under Durura can you eat pork. But there's lots of disagreement about, let's say, uh, eating um, alligator. Disagreement about eating alligator. So if you're living in Florida, let's say, a place where people eat, and it's really causing you a lot of problems that you can't eat the alligator or sushi at the, the, the cafeteria at your work, then you could take the ruling of the Awzai who allows you to eat alligator meat. So this is, it's, it's not allowing what's prohibited in, by agreement, but it's allowing you to pick and choose between methods. Uh, the, the th so that's the kind of what becomes the middle approach to this issue, and it's very common in amongst Shafi scholars in the, especially the Middle East. The, the third school is the, the strictest. This I have found to be the uh, prevalent mostly amongst Hanafis, whether in the Ottoman Empire or in South Asia, which is that really you should follow one school of law. And if you don't know what a school of law is because you're really uneducated, which is fine, then you just follow one authority, your village mufti or somebody. You follow that one person, whatever they do, or whatever they tell you, you do. And you don't go picking and choosing. This is, you, you find this uh, amongst later Ottoman scholars. You also find this amongst, uh, the, in the Deoban school, in, in the Dalaroom <coughs> system in, in the whole world, the Dalaroom network. But it's important to note that this is not Ex this also has an exception. It has an exception in the sense that from the, the side of the scholar, the scholar is still able to choose between madhabs in situations of darura, as Rashid Ahmed Gangohi said. I guess Ibrahim Musa is not here. He could talk about Rashid Ahmed Gangohi. But um, he's, Rashid Ahmed Gangohi, one of the early um, Deoban scholars, said that he will take a position from another school of law if it is a necessity. Other Deoband scholars said if there's a if there's a strong need or a moment belwa, something that is causing difficulty for the Muslim community, but they will do that in as some, as a scholar issuing a fatwa. It's not up to the lay person to pick and choose between things based on what they feel their needs are. It's up to the scholar and his or her ability as someone drawing on the legal heritage to come up with a ruling to give to those lay people. So that's the most uh, kind of the strictest approach. I just wanted to, to talk about two, I, I think, if I have time, two, but maybe just one case study here, for example, and, and one has to do with um, Islamic, uh, well, we're going to talk about marriage, we'll keep talking about marriage, which is uh, marriage age. And what is the, can you, can a Muslim government or can Muslim scholars legitimately in Islam say that, that we can say that, uh, it is illegal for a man or woman to marry, let's say, under the age of 16. Why is that a problem? Anybody have a guess? Why is it a problem for Muslim to say that uh, you cannot marry somebody under the age of 16? Because the Prophet married Aisha when she was 9 or 10 years old. Arguably. Yeah, but arguably. Anyway, the, all schools of law say that she was 9 or 10 years old, therefore, you're acceptable. You can't go and say what the prophet did was wrong. It's haram. So how how do you do this? Um, what when this was first this restriction was first, uh, 
was first introduced, or a restriction on marriage age was first introduced in the Ottoman Family Law of 1917, and then was followed in places like Egypt and legal reforms in 1923, and in basically every other um, Middle Eastern country, which it's not true, most of them uh, up until then. Um, how does this art? Argued. How could you argue this Islamically? One, you wouldn't say this is a statement about what's halal haram. You're saying this is simply the, the ruler acting in his capacity as an executive and placing an, an administrative restriction on judges. So if you live in a village and you go out and marry your 13 year old daughter, gets married to your 13 year old neighbor's son, and you do a, 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 a nikah, that's legal in God's eyes. But you can't go to court and, and, and uh, register because the sultan is, or the ruler has said that the court can only register marriages to people 16 and over. That's one argument, which is using the executive power of the, the ruler. The second one is to reach back into that great grab bag of Islamic legal heritage and find where's the exact part that I need. Ah, the Kufan scholar of the 8th century, Ibn Shubrama, who was a contemporary of Abu Hanifa, never had a medhab, but was a very respected scholar in his day. Ibn Shubrama, supposedly, um, said that you could not have any marriage contract for anyone under age. I, I also want to clarify here, no, no school of law that I know of, and I've looked at this issue in depth, says you can have sex with someone who's underage. You cannot have sex with someone who is not pubescent. But of course, that's really hard to, to legislate. You know, you could legislate it's hard to know when people um, start puberty. The, the, the issue we're talking about here isn't sex, it's the marriage contract. In general, the schools of law and Islam say a marriage contract can be done with someone who's, who's prepubescent. You just can't actually, there can't be consummation of the marriage. So uh, what uh, Ibn Shubhama says is there cannot be any contract at all before the person reaches um, Balu before they reach basically uh, physical maturity. So you go back and you reach and you find the position of Ibn Shubhrama. Now, uh, why is this problematic? Because what is the correct motive? What is, what is motivating the scholars involved in this discussion? Are the scholars involved in this discussion truly concerned with advancing Muslim, the welfare of the Muslim community? Are they truly um, doing what they think God wants of them? Or are they advancing a position that is popular with, uh, the, at that time, uh, British supervision of Egyptian public life and its influence on Egyptian values? There was lots of discussion about this in Egypt in the 1920s. There continues to be discussion about it until today and lots of, part. you don't have to wait very long maybe just two or three weeks, I bet, before there'll be something on your Facebook page where some mufti says that it's okay to marry a 12 year old and someone will get outraged by that. So there's, there's always a continuous uh, train of, of, of outrages over this issue until today. Or are those people, are those scholars arguing from an age restriction, actually coming up with a legitimate opinion, uh, which, which really does represent the best interest of the Muslim community and what God wants from Muslims in this day and age. And that was the position that was taken by lots of a very conservative Muslim scholars in Egypt, people like uh, Sheikh Al Azhar Abdul Halim Mahmoud and uh, even uh, Ali Tantawi, who died in 1999, I believe. He's a Syrian scholar who worked as a judge in the Damascus uh, courts before the uh, courts were totally secularized in the 1950s. And he later moved to Saudi Arabia. It's more famous for his TV shows, but he he, he also um, he objected to morally saying that it was wrong to marry someone who was under 16. But he had no problem as a functionary of the state working in a Sharia court applying the ruler's restriction that you not um, register a marriage with someone who is with, for someone who is under 16. The second example uh, I'll give very briefly also actually involves Ibn Shubhrama. Ibn Shubhrama is this scholar who no one really hears about, but oddly is at the, the center of two big debates in the modern Islamic, modern Islamic thought. One is marriage age restriction. The second is the crucial 
transaction that allows Muslims to have Islamic mortgages, which is al-bay' al murabaha al amr shira right? So what that means is, if I want to buy a house, so I go to the bank and I say, bank, buy this house for me. I will buy it. I promise I will buy it from you over a period of time with an inflated price. That's how you can have an Islamic mortgage. However, the problem is that none of the schools of law allow you to have a sale with conditions. So by saying, buy this for me and I promise I'll buy it from you, you're not allowed to do that. In the sense that that promise is not legally enforceable. It can be morally enforceable, it's not legally enforceable. <clears throat> Except for whom? Ibn Shubrama. Alhamdulillah. Ibn Shubrama <laughs> said, you can do this. So in 1979, when there's the first uh, international financial co conference for Islamic, uh, what is it, Mu'tamar al-Awwal al-Masraf al islami in Dubai in 1979, they go back and say, Ibn Shubrama's opinion is the one we're going to take. And this allows this. And this has become very important in Islamic finance. But, of course, lots of people objected to this. One, uh, the, the great uh, Palestinian, originally Palestinian, later resident Kuwait scholar, uh, Suleiman Muhammad al-Ashqar, wrote in an objection to this, that this is absolute uh, uh, perversion of the Islamic legal outlook on this issue. That, in fact, no one really knows what Ibn Shubhrama's opinion was. And this is a, an important issue as well, which is that the problem with taking like companion opinions and people who didn't have medhebs is that we don't really know what their rulings were. We don't really know what Ibn Abbas thought about Muta marriage. There's just reports. We don't really know what Ibn Abbas uh, or what Ibn Shubhrama thought about sales and contracts. So we just have a few reports. We don't have a comprehensive school of Ibn Shubhrama that's been looked at generation after generation after generation and checked and rechecked and refined. So that's why all, all these different approaches I talked about earlier to mixing and mashing between schools of law, it's between established schools of law. They're all very, very skeptical and very suspicious of going back before the schools of law to companions and people like that. You cannot go back and take their rulings because you don't know what their rulings were. You just have these hints, these echoes in, in recorded in, in history. So the Al-Ashqar criticizes this 1979 Islamic conference ruling on finance. It says, you, this is clearly designed to allow Muslims to participate in a modern financial system, which is based on riba, which is unacceptable in Islam. Now, where the truth in that lies, Allahu alam. But I think you'll see with those examples of marriage age, with divorce, with muta marriage, with Islamic finance, that on these issues, it's very hard to tell. Is it the best argument that carries the day, or is it what's politically popular? And by politically popular, I don't just mean politically within one country. I mean politically amongst Muslims who are uh, who cannot avoid having their discussions about their religion within the greater hegemonic context of modernity, of globalized Western values. It's very hard to know what really is determining what God wants on any one issue. Thanks very much.